us today. Before we start our meeting, let me introduce our moderator today. Today, our moderator is Dr. Iskander Abdullayev. Uh, Dr. Iskander Abdullayev uh, is a deputy director of Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Institute. He has intensive training and education programs in the countries as Israel, USA, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Has over 25 years of experience in water management, water institution, environmental activities in Afghanistan and five Central Asia countries. Prior joining of Tsarek in 2019 and 2013, Dr. Abdullah worked as regional advisor for Germany's Berlin Initiative Transboundary Water Management Central Asia program at the German Society for International Cooperation. Also, he worked in the position of senior researcher at ZEF Center for Development Research University of Bonn in Germany and conducted research in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Dr. Abdullah uh, has also has experience in International Water Management Institute in Sri Lanka and his research focus included Central Asia, Iran, Pakistan, Thailand and Sri Lanka. Dr. Abdullah very well linked with research, scientific societies of the region and worldwide. He is a member of International Water Resource Association, member of editorial boards of few international peer-reviewed journals. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Iskander, for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gulshat uh, colleagues. It's my pleasure to be facilitator of this fascinating, interesting uh, uh, meeting. Uh, because uh, the title is very interesting, The Future of Caspian Sea Economy or Ecology. Uh, the event is hosted by Open Central Asia Magazine and Eurasian Creative Guild. You know, a Caspian Sea uh, with its abundant resources plays an important role in socioeconomic development of the region whole and also states which are literal to the uh, sea. Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia and Turkmenistan, the country is sharing the sea. They are faced with difficulties in building effective regional cooperation due to different position on legal status of the sea before the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the entire Caspian Sea was under the formal jurisdiction of only two states. Uh, it's the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, it's USSR, former, and Iran. After the collapse of Soviet Union, the increased number of littoral states required transboundary cooperation on issues related to Caspian Sea. In 2018, Caspian countries have signed convention on legal status of the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea, located in the middle of the Eurasian continent, is a unique landlocked water mass and contains exclusive fisheries, enormous oil and gas resources. However, the sea's ecosystem has been degraded due to intensive anthropogenic activities. The oil industry, agriculture, fisheries, transportation, hydropower generation are the sectors for which the Caspian Sea water resources are most important. The Caspian Sea nowadays endures crucial environmental degradation, including biodiversity loss, water quality degradation, soil contamination, and poor public health, weak environment regulation, and the absence of joint efforts in five littoral states We use the effectiveness of efforts to protect the Caspian Sea. However, Caspian region became one of the important trade and transport corridors for Asia, Middle East, and Caucasus region. Therefore, it is important to discuss and share ideas present different views on how Caspian Sea could be developed. Keeping this in mind, Open uh, Central Asia magazine, Eurasian Creative Guild, is organizing this webinar titled The Future of the Caspian Sea. I myself is an environmentalist and have been engaged before uh, looking to Caspian Sea on RLC. And this picture of RLC still makes me worried what will be the future of the Caspian Sea. However, I think the last 20 years also economic opportunities related to Caspian Sea increasing. And Caspian countries are more and more effectively would like to use it as a resource for economic uh, uh, the development. So these are the uh, focus areas and I will uh, share later questions, but before I do so, I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Mark Ahmedjanov, uh, who is the publisher of his OSA magazine and vice chairman of Eurasian Creative Guild to give an opening rem uh, remarks for this meeting. Yeah. Mark is committed uh, to promoting literature throughout the Eurasia. He launched the publishing houses like Silk, uh, Silk Road Media and others. He provides global audience with new perspectives on contemporary society, art, history, traditions, and sociology of Eurasian region. So he was the one of the organizers of first open Eurasia book forum in Bishkek in 2012. 
And now it is uh, seven years the, the his forum has uh, seen been staged throughout Europe and Asia. In addition to his role uh, as a founder and bilingual publisher house of Silk Road Media, Mark is also a vice chairman of the Eurasian Creative Council, a guild, as a nonprofit organization yeah. dedicated to the development of an open society uniting creative people and writers from across Eurasia. I'd like to ask if uh, uh, Mark is here to give his opening uh, remarks before we go uh, and start our session. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Iskander. Thank you, a distinguished guest of uh, today's Zoom meeting. It's uh, happy to greet all of you on our fourth uh, Open Central Asia Zoom uh, conference. Uh, many of you probably uh, been already uh, reading OCA magazine for last 11 years with the only English language magazine in London um, covering Central Asia and Eurasia in different um, views and aspects uh, of uh, development. Uh, myself and Nick Rowan, uh, when we established the Open Central Asia magazine back in 2008, uh, put ourselves a target to build the culture and informational land bridges uh, between Europe and Asia. And it's been successfully done. We have got over 50,000 subscribers online. We've got uh, most of the embassies and diplomatic missions in Eurasia and in UK reading and distributing our magazine. Uh, over 50 members of the British Parliament are subscribing to our magazine. So we are important bridge between Europe and Asia. Whatever we publish and promote is re really reach the target. And the target is uh, influencers, decision makers, diplomats, politicians. Uh, so we've been doing in print for 11 years. With pandemic, we discovered that we can also do it online and not just by publishing magazine, but also bringing experts into one discussion um, platform and talk about what is important for uh, Central Asia and Eurasia in general. And today's topic, it is definitely important because being a, a largest geographical lake or how we call it the Caspian Sea is uh, unite and divide countries on both sides, Europe and Asia. It's, it's, it will be discussed and it will be um, uh, a subject of treaties, uh, disputes, cooperation, uh, friendship, unfortunately conflicts as has been in the past. Uh, so we need to talk about it and we need to find uh, the common views uh, and differences. Uh, so it, 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 it will be the subject understood uh, by as many people as possible, both in UK and uh, around the world. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, uh, my team who did work uh, on uh, the project to organize meeting um, today. And I wish everyone to have a great uh, discussion. And once again, thank you to our moderator, Iskander Abdullai, for um, helping us and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, listening to your opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very good update and outline. I hope that this meeting's results also will be partially at least published in your very good journal. And uh, we are looking forward to have today interesting discussion. Because as you, uh, you say, uh, this is a very interesting topic itself, both, uh, both environmentally and also economically. So during this meeting, I want to ask our presenters, I have four excellent uh, experts with me, to highlight uh, some historical, political, economic, and cultural role and aspects of Caspian Sea. And then if they could highlight also about the projects related to the Caspian Sea today, what are the, uh, are, are the plans? Also, we would like to see what are the economic issues you want to see. Most, uh, last but not uh, least, important aspect is ec ecosystem of Caspian Sea, which also a very important part of uh, development in this region. So uh, with great pleasure, I would like to uh, start uh, one by one inviting our speakers to provide their inputs. I'll start with Dr. Stanislav Pritchin, Senior Research Fellow, Center for Post-Soviet Studies a member of Russian Academy of Science, Moscow. Prior to his position, he was an Academy of Robert Bosch Fellow at Russia and Eurasia program Chatham House uh, uh, in 2017 and 2018. His research interests covers political and economic development of the Caspian Sea, Central Asia, 
and South Caucasus countries. Uh, Stanislav received his PhD uh, on the international legal status of the Caspian Sea and strategic interests of Russian Federation in the region in 1991, 2011 from the Institute of Oriental Studies in 2012. Since 2015, Stanislav has regularly taken part in the OEC-led missions as an election observer. He also lectured as Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy in Baku, Tehran State University, Alameh Tabia University in Tehran, and Kyrgyz Russian Slavic University in Bishkek. Since 2013, Stanislav has been an executive partner of the Expert Center for Eurasian Development, an independent and consulting group of experts based in Moscow. Stanislav, my question to you, and I, we, as you know from, uh, we know from your background that you can highlight and help us to understand what are the plans and projects planned for the Caspian region, and we are uh, looking forward to receive from you information. Floor is yours, Stanislav, please. Hey, thanks a lot, Dr. Abdullayev. Thank you for your kind introduction. And, and it's great honor for me to open this uh, meeting with you, dear colleagues. Uh, yes, the Caspian Sea is the main priority of my uh, expert on science work for uh, several years. And uh, I'm uh, very precisely uh, focused on this area and development. So historically speaking, after the collapse of USSR, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned uh, previously, the peak of interest uh, among geopolitical powers uh, was in the region in the early 90s when the first steps in exploring reaches of oil and gas in the Caspian Sea were launched. Uh, so in 1994 in Baku was uh, signed the so-called the agreement of the century when several uh, major from the West with government of Azerbaijan decided to develop as a rich Ragunashli offshore huge oil and gas developments. It was the start of using and uh, opening new stage of developing huge economical projects in the Caspian Sea. Then later, we were witnesses of new stage of ge geopolitical uh, struggle for pipelines. Of course, for newly independent states, firstly for Azerbaijan, the key question was to how to export its oil and gas independently from Russia and Iran. Previously, all pipelines uh, for export or gas and oil from Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan uh, bypassed through Russia. And to avoid this dependency with support of Western uh, companies, Azerbaijan constructed a very famous Baku Belisi Jihan. It was a breakthrough for Azerbaijan and its partners to achieve the uh, deep water port in the Mediterranean Sea in Jehan to transport its oil independently from Iran and Russia to international market. Uh, meanwhile, all this time, negotiations on the legal status of the Caspian Sea went on and uh, uh, as you know, in August 2018 was the very significant day in uh, uh, history of uh, the Caspian Sea. Five presidents of literal countries signed the so-called Constitution of Legal Status, Constitution of the Caspian Sea, the uh, Convention of Legal Status of the Caspian Sea. From my perspective, this is the most important uh, document which regulates all aspects of cooperation in the Caspian Sea among uh, Caspian Five, how to divide, uh, with one exception, how to divide this uh, sea. This, uh, this issue uh, uh, left for the level of bilateral and trilateral relations uh, in order to avoid additional competition. So uh, returning to the Caspian uh, Convention, this document regulates all spheres of cooperation of the Caspian Sea, firstly in economy, in uh, technical regulation of construction trust Caspian projects, uh, in security. Uh, for example, this uh, agreement uh, created a, uh, and established the very uh, stable and safety security regional system. According to the key principles of this regional security, the 
first element. The Caspian Sea was announced as the uh, the sea of the peace, and all conflicts and struggles should be resolved through negotiations. The second very important for regional stability issue is uh, the uh, the principle of not. Uh, providing your territory, uh, territory of one of the country for any activities against the partners within the Caspian Five. In other words, uh, for example, if the United States will one day decide to use the Azeri territory for uh, pressure to Iran, they cannot use it legally uh, because Azerbaijan uh, and other uh, countries, players, have their own obligations within the Caspian Sea not to provide their territory for any aggressions. And the second, uh, the third uh, key principle for regional security is not uh, providing your territory for any external military activities uh, and military presence. So the Caspian Sea uh, is the area where only Caspian Sea countries can have the military bases, Navy, soldiers. So, and uh, from, from my perspective, uh, this aspect of convention help to avoid any uh, military activities uh, towards Iran, especially in 2018. It was very uh, drastic period of history in, the, um, in the, the Caspian Sea. On the one hand, uh, Caspian Five achieved this very significant result in negotiations after 22 years, they finally signed this agreement. But at the same time, the decision of Donald Trump to withdraw from nuclear deal with Iran drastically changed uh, investment climate in the Caspian Sea. So the risk of uh, financial sanctions from the United States blocked any activities for new huge projects in the first in the southern part of the Caspian Sea. So previously, in March 2018, Azerbaijan and Iran started negotiations of common using the bordering oil and gas reserves on the border, potential border between Azeri and Iranian sectors on the Caspian Sea. And of course, due to the depth of the sea this, and this uh, area, without uh, Western technologies, without uh, advanced uh, technologies from British Petroleum, ExxonMobil, it is impossible to start this project. But the risk and decision of the United States uh, blocked any activities of uh, Western companies to take part in this uh, project. So from this perspective, we could see the main obstacle for huge new oil and gas projects in the Caspian Sea. This is the position of the United States and current tensions between United States and Iran. Uh, regarding to other regarding to other questions uh, and our other obstacles, we could see, of course, economical situations. For example, in gas area, LNG projects uh, and competition in European market for consumers now create. Uh, not so friendly for producer of gas environment when new projects such as possible Trans-Caspian pipeline are uh, almost impossible because from the point of view of economy it's too, re too expensive and uh, it's almost impossible to make such project profitable. So in such circumstances of course we also see very strong restrictions for new oil and gas projects uh, in the Caspian Sea. But at the same time, of course, Caspian Sea is, uh, uh, occupies very important uh, area in the center of Eurasia and traditionally was very important transport hub in the region. And now we can see that uh, several projects uh, such as Belt and Road Initiative in cooperation with Baku Tbilisi, uh, Baku Tbilisi cars uh, railways uh, is one important direction for uh, regional transport projects. Another one, the North-South uh, project, uh, including Iran, R Azerbaijan, and Russia, is also is going on. Its contraction next year. Iran uh, is promising to finish and to complete the the last Iranian part of railway, which 
will connect the Persian Gulf with the Caspian Sea with, with Russian transport infrastructure. And it means that in the future, uh, goods from India through Iran and Caspian Sea and Russia will could achieve uh, uh, European market. So uh, this is mostly about huge economical projects. But at the same time, of course, uh, we could also expect uh, other projects, for example, in fishing. This is a very, very important for regional economy uh, uh, aspect of cooperation. And at the same time, all five countries considering, for example, touristic cluster as an important area for future development. So now on the table is a question of uh, five site uh, visa project when any tourist who will visit uh, the Caspian Sea will can uh, visit all five countries. It will be a, a real breakthrough for touristic cluster for the Caspian Sea. So I see that uh, probably my time is over. Thank you so much uh, for your attention and I will, happy to, will be happy to answer your questions if you have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stanislav. Uh, first of all, I think you covered not only economic projects and prospects, but also you gave a, a quite good explanation of the Caspian Agreement, which is uh, sets some kind of example to the same like in RLC region where we have also sharing these water resources. I, I, I'm looking forward for a lot of questions uh, may come from uh, uh, audience uh, participants, but so time being, we will go ahead, please colleagues, participants, write your questions in the chat box. I would like to thank Stanislav again for his uh, highlights on economic and trade and other prospects of the Caspian Sea. But Caspian Sea exists for thousands of years and it has a rich history. Also, it relates to a lot of developments in the region. So I would like to uh, ask our next speaker, speaker Dr. Gerald Mako, uh, research affiliate, Cambridge Central Asia Forum, University of Cambridge, to highlight some aspects of the historical and cultural role in other aspects of the, of the sea. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gerald Marco is an affiliated researcher at the Cambr Cambridge Central Asia Forum, Jesus College, Cambridge University. He has been publishing extensively on Russia and Central Asia with a special uh, uh, reference to the topics like Soviet nation building or uh, conversion of, to Islam and holds an, a PhD in development studies from Cambridge University. Gerald has ample of experience in working in these international organizations like UNDP, WHO, or other, uh, others like Con Con Commonwealth Secretary. Uh, his uh, uh, area uh, also uh, includes some new emerging uh, uh, issues like uh, Syrian refugees uh, uh, problems in Turkey and beyond. So I hope, uh, Gerald, uh, you will give us more understanding what is the Caspian Sea is, what was the historically and what culturally. Looking forward for your uh, presentation and the floor is yours, Gerald. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullayev. It's great to be here, even if it's in a pixelized format, um, as it is the way nowadays. Now, when we talk about oil, usually we think of um, oil fields that were discovered for the past 50 or 70 years, and this applies to pretty much all of the industry, but this is not the case of uh, the Caspian, or indeed, in case of Azerbaijan, for example, because oil wells were dug, uh, being dug in the region for more than a thousand years. And even though I don't want to bore you with all the details, it was certainly not on an industrial scale. It was usually for usage of everyday life, uh, medical purposes, um, but mostly for heating, not too creatively. Um, and even later on, um, to jump around 900 years, Azerbaijan and the wider region was um, truly one of the birthplaces of oil industry. Um, by the end of the 19th century, Baku came to be known as the Black Gold Capital, quite a telling name. And it was an important destination where a great many experts were flocking. You can call it a kind of Black Silicon Valley, if you like. And usually we think at least those who were not dealing with the region when they think about this uh, fairly heroic um, episode of oil and to a lesser extent gas industry would think of Texas, Southern uh, California. Um, there will be blood with the great uh, lead of Daniel Day-Lewis. However, here it was just as important. Um, 
by the turn of the previous millennium, well, sorry, the previous century, 120 years ago, Baku already had more than 3,000 oil wells, 2,000 of which were uh, pumping at an industrial scale. And briefly, it's quite a curious thing, uh, between um, 1898 and 1901, Baku was producing more oil than the whole of the US. It was a very brief period, uh, but it's quite very telling. And um, well, to jump a little bit again, in 1920, the Bolsheviks captured Azerbaijan, and of course, all the private property was conf uh, conf uh, confiscated. And we, as a result, talk somewhat less about oil in the Caspian and in the region than we do it in case of taxes. No GR Ewings were venturing here. And um, that being said, the importance of the region did remain. Uh, for example, by 1941, at the beginning of the war for Russia, um, Azerbaijan was producing about 13 and a half million tons of oil per year. Uh, with this output, it actually had 72% of all the Soviet um, output of oil. Um, and to jump a teeny little bit, because we don't have much time, the USSR, of course, fell apart in 1990. And as it was already mentioned, um, in 1990, there were only two countries that were bordering um, the Caspian, the Soviet Union, and Iran. After um, a year later, uh, there were five countries, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, that significantly uh, complicates things for the region. And in 1991, the US had very, uh, very high hopes that maybe oil and gas from the Caspian Sea could become an alternative to the Middle East as a source of oil, um, especially because the states there in the region, aside from Iran, not exactly a stoned ally of the US nowadays, um, are not members, were not members of the OPEC, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. And um, by around the 19, in the early 1990s, there was actually a very popular bumper sticker among American diplomats that said, happiness is multiple pipelines, quite a telling one. However, things were not at, that easy, starting with the problems whether, what is the RLC? Is it a sea or a lake? Um, this might sound very nebulous for most and some of the curiosity of geography. However, for the past 30 years, this is a very important discussion simply because if it's a lake that can be divided equally um, between all five countries, each of them receiving 20%. However, if it is a sea, that it will be divided based on the length of their borders, um, well, their seashore. And uh, Iran especially was not exactly happy with this alternative solution. And nowadays it would seem that this will be um, 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 concluded. However, uh, what's worthy of mentioning and, and well, other is going to dwell on this in length is that um, the Caspian has about a thousand years of history of producing oil, and especially for the past 150 years. But this is not something of a uh, thing of the past, and this is very much worth emphasizing. Um, 20 years ago, the Kazgan oil field was discovered in uh, northeastern uh, part of the Caspian, and this is well then hailed as the largest oil discovery in 50 years and currently it is the largest offshore oil field um, outside the Middle East and one can mention the Shah Deniz gas field in Azerbaijan which is one of the top 20 largest um, fields in the world. So the Caspian certainly holds a lot of surprises still and on that note one can mention it with a glimpse of hope that it is in many ways truly a miracle that despite the industrial oil um, uh, well activities and gas to the lesser extent in the region for more than 150 years, um, the sea or well lake by some is not yet being totally ruined um, as um, 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 mildly optimistic I might sound. I would like to think that things will go somewhat better from now on. Uh, conservation efforts, by the way, started by um, the 
uh, 40s in many ways, for example, in case of the Caspian tiger, which by the way, unfortunately, was deemed extinct in 2003. But so efforts started many, many decades ago, and hopefully these will um, um, continue in the future and the sea or lake can be, can be saved and further damage won't be done at a large scale. Unfortunately, it is very much tied to economy and uh, between uh, preservation of nature and economy considerations, very often the latter wins, but one should hope for the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Gerald. Excellent inputs indeed. We are expected to uh, receive from you this kind of historical review of what was uh, going on there last 150 years, at least photos of early 20s, you could see a lot of uh, oil uh, wells uh, in, in near the Baku. And this picture exactly shows how much intensively uh, still sea have been used uh, in hundreds of years ago. And it's going to be. And I'm, I'm also very, uh, I, can, I can join join on your pragmatic optimism, which, has, uh, which says that future is better. Uh, hoping so, and uh, this is an indeed this is very interesting area, and environment is very, very important because this Caspian ecosystem includes 400 endemic species, and including 115 types of fish. It's 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 extensive. So how how, how these things could be saved, and uh, maybe uh, also biodiversity could be improved. Uh, but still, it depends how much and what kind of activities we're going to conduct. Maybe we can highlight a little bit about environmental issues, sustainability aspects of the uh, uh, using the sea. Uh, th there is no, uh, no way we, will, uh, we can't, cannot avoid uh, that sea will be just the environmental space. It will be, of course, economic space. And I, I already in the beginning mentioned there is a lot of... Uh, plans to develop not only Caspian region, but Caspian region linking Asia and Europe and other parts of the world. Therefore, I think I could ask our ne next speaker, Kali Berman, a researcher at the Center of Development Studies, University of Cambridge, to help us highlight these uh, areas. Kali Berman's research interest uh, e explores the notion of sustainability to consider its diverse understandings and forms of practices across cultural contexts. Driving on an extensive background in agriculture and ranching across the Western United States and Australia, Kali engages with the diverse ways in which resources come to be defined and gain value within a, a cultural setting. In her current PhD work at the University of Cambridge, she is examining sustainability's meaning making in the modern day Caspian region trough and analysis of sturgeon aquaculture. Kali holds a, a BSc in geology, BSc in environment science, BA international relations from University of Wyoming. Uh, Kali, the uh, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Eskander, for your kind introduction. And I too hope to contribute to a um, yeah, very pragmatic hopefulness for what the Caspian Sea in terms of biodiversity and um, sustainability holds. Um, and I'm very interested in this question of, as um, the presentation title suggests, economy or ecology, and if it necessarily need be one or the other. But um, again, just to build on my introduction a little bit to give everyone a sense of how I approach um, this question of sustainability and ecology in the Caspian Sea. Um, I conducted field work in three of the five Caspian's littoral states by going and visiting the array of aquaculture facilities. So in Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan to understand what is the nature of aquaculture or fish farming, if you will, in the Caspian Sea today. And specifically, I looked at um, the cultivation of sturgeon fish. And as many of you might be familiar, caviar is produced from the eggs of sturgeon. And actually 90% of the world's caviar has historically been produced from um, the sturgeon in the Caspian Sea. There are six species and four of them have primarily been um, producing caviar. And as most of you know, caviar has a very long history and generally is understood around the world as being something that is equated with wealth and luxury, but um, what is the state of the industry today and what can we learn from sustainability or about sustainability from the Caspian by exploring the industry? 
Um, and I think it's very important to bear in mind though, before we get into the particulars of the industry today, that the, the peoples of the Caspian have a very, very long shared civilizational history. And that this has been supported by a very complex and highly developed system of knowledge that has supported um, life ways that go back millennia. And so that when we look at the contemporary issues of sustainability, it's very important to bear in mind that there are historical layers to this very much as Gerald suggested. So much of my work was spent visiting fish farms. And in fact, much of the fish farm industry or fishing infrastructure was really developed during Soviet times. And indeed the first uh, fish hatchery in the world was built in Azerbaijan in 1953. And a lot of the techniques and facilities for breeding and rearing sturgeon and many fish in fact, um, undergird the growing global um, aquaculture industry today. So very, very significant. But what's, what's amazing is you go today and in all of these three states that I visited, there is massive and the latest and greatest infrastructure and technology. So you have a very clear modern investment layer for maintaining these kind of capabilities. But what's interesting is for my research, what was actually the kind of product that's coming out at the end. And so not so much, there's an increasing orientation towards the meat from sturgeon uh, rather than caviar. And when you appreciate or consider this changing end product, if you will, um, it actually ties in very interestingly with traditional or historic practices around this resource. And that when we look at the archaeological record, we can see that fish has actually been an incredibly important protein source for millennia. And this is evidenced through ethnographic work and how fish is still used, but also um, within the last couple of years, there's been a lot of really interesting and important work about using um, isotope analysis and finding that fish as a key protein source has been much more significant for supporting um, much of the mobility life ways in the region than previously thought. And so when, when we allow ourselves these kind of changes in perspective of how we approach the historical record in the region, um, this has also prompted more archeological work and there's been new surveying going back and looking and finding that a lot of previous instruments or apparatuses and um, tools that have been recovered from many dig sites that were previously thought to be horse instruments or for other purposes have increasingly been found to be actually fishing instruments. And so what's interesting, um, I think that many of you will also find, or if you're familiar with the region, that when you approach the Caspian, um, the so-called national dishes, and I apologize for discussing food dangerously close to the lunch hour, but um, that when you go and see plov in Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan or um, Beshbarmak in Kazakhstan, again, these now nationalized dishes that are very, very old to the peoples of this, cast, of this region, that um, typically it is some sort of red meat, be it horse or goat or sheep or beef, um, but within a certain proximity to the Caspian shores, it becomes, the meat source becomes fish. And so this is very much tied, and this is appreciated widely and culturally, and that when visiting fish farms as a researcher, it's insisted upon that in order to understand the industry, um, you have to participate in this other, this um, parallel system of how resources are appreciated and continue to be understood. And that there's a very deep, um, knowledge that's informing the practices today. And so when we, for me, when we think about uh, sustainability and how it comes to be defined that it's, it's very much a process and it's something that's continually in the making. And so when we think about it in the context of a certain resource that it, we can ask sustainability for whom? And that actually in the modern era, we can have a very clear technological layer that enables resource or access to certain resources, i.e. a fish in this case, but that the end product is shifting much more away from one end use of, i.e. caviar, much more towards the meat end. And that this is actually enabling a continued appreciation for traditional ways and for also providing key food sources for local populations rather than so much for export. Or if it is for export, it's very much within the region itself. So, um, yeah, I wanted to 
offer that perspective on what sustainability actually can mean and that there's actually been, um, there holds some very promising investment for um, expanding a lot of this aquaculture and food provisioning within this industry. So I'll stop with that, but thank you very much and look forward to some Q&A to build on that. Thank you, Carrie. Very good uh, background about the sustainability issue. Indeed, uh, sometimes we are not linking the culture and also history with the habits and trends in our uh, both uh, resource use and also our, uh, our exploitation of the resources. Indeed, uh, I think fish is, uh, I, I, I can join you. Fish was uh, an easier one of the maybe central element uh, for environmental health of the Caspian Sea. Sometimes ago, we were uh, having these stories about uh, a, a disappearance of many types of fish from uh, Caspian Sea. But recently again, we see it's coming back and making back, but then also habits are changing. Uh, habits may be related to the culture and also historical uh, background of people living. So I think this is very good analysis and maybe uh, uh, for uh, uh, making much more policy decisions, we have to really take care of these linkages. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the Caspian Sea's future uh, is also economy, not only environment. This is clear and we cannot ignore it. And I'm repeating it maybe a second time. Therefore, I think it's very important to understand the uh, economic issues, uh, economic prospects associated with this Caspian Sea. Uh, uh, this question I would like to ask from our next expert, Dr. Serik Arasgaliev, uh, Assistant Professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy, Nazarbayev University. Dr. Uh, Serik Arasgaliev's research interests include governments and multinational enterprises, institutions and development policies, international political economy. His previous appointments include visiting fa uh, fac faculty position at Lee Kuan Yew School uh, of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and visiting research affiliate at the Cambridge Central Asia Forum, is a recipient of Polashak International Scholarship in Asian Universities Alliance Schools Award. Serik, uh, floor is yours. Please looking forward for your inputs. Thank you very much, Professor Abdullayev, and uh, uh, I, uh, hello and uh, to all participants and. Uh, I'd like to build upon what uh, my colleagues already uh, talked uh, today about. So we, we started this meeting with the uh, agreement uh, on the status of the Caspian Sea. So uh, talking about the political economy of the Caspian region, I'd like to highlight, uh, I think uh, I have only about 10 minutes. So I think I'll, I'd like to speak about the two points here is that uh, the first point is that the agreement on the uh, legal status of the Caspian Sea is not something that uh, happened overnight. It's not the kind of agreement that countries decided to sign uh, uh, within the framework of one uh, bilateral or, un or multilateral meeting. Uh, it's been building up and uh, before the signing of the uh, declaration on the status of the Caspian Sea, the uh, informal regime has been building up. And then the second point that I, I want to make uh, is that uh, uh, on the uh, geopolitical side, I think um, two important events uh, also uh, facilitated or uh, has led to the signing of the agreement. Uh, the first is the uh, imposition of the sanctions against Russia and Iran recently, uh, uh, which led to the convergence of in the positions of these two countries on many issues, including the Caspian dispute. And secondly, uh, the increasing participation of China in Central Asia and the Caspian region, which led to attempts on the part of uh, uh, the uh, regional powers and including Russia and Iran to reestablish regional cooperation to counterbalance China's influence. And of course, we know that China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, as well as its cooperation with the Caspian states, is expected to foster closer economic integration in Eurasia. But it has also intensified competition between ge geopolitical actors in the region. So, for example, uh, if only Kazakhstan and China ha have signed uh, 127 agreements uh, on investment that worth 67 billion US dollars. So these are the points that I'd like to uh, focus on today. So starting with the building of the uh, informal regime. 
So despite that there was no uniform agreement between uh, Caspian region, each of the states started to explore uh, and develop their hydrocarbon resources. So Azerbaijan, Iran, and Turkmenistan, they still have contested areas uh, of, on, or with oil deposits despite their agreement, but this has not stopped the countries from developing contested oil reserves. And this affects stability in the region and might potentially cause further conflicts uh, but hy hydrocarbon resources of the Caspian region uh, distributed unevenly in the sea, and this, of course, this will uh, be could be the potential cause of uh, resource conflicts. And uh, as I said, in the absence of agreement, the informal regime has been evolving. Countries proceeded with oil extraction uh, projects and the construction of overland pipelines, and of course, there were. Uh, I think one uh, benefit of the geopolitical competition that Caspian states uh, had is that they had multiple choices in building the pipeline infrastructure. So they had the northern north option to build the pipelines to Russia. They had the uh, western option to build the pipeline towards the Black Sea through by, uh, to, uh, or to the uh, Mediterranean Sea in Turkey. And then the southern option to build a pipeline to Persian Gulf was blocked uh, due to sanctions against Iran. And then, of course, the eastern option, which is building pipelines to China, which many of the uh, Caspian states successfully used. Uh, Turkmenistan managed to build a gas pipeline to China, and the Kazakhstan now uh, exports its oil to China via uh, oil pipeline. So uh, this is some of the benefits of the competition, uh, geopolitical competition that Ca Caspian uh, countries could use uh, for their own benefit. But uh, there are, of course, several projects. And it's, it's all started, uh, for example, from uh, early 1990s. So in December 1993, Kazakhstan signed a contract with a group of uh, multinationals uh, to explore the Caspian shelf. And of course, uh, members included Egypt, BG, BP, Statoil, Mobile, Mobile, and uh, Total, Shell, and many other countries. And uh, similarly, in 1994, Azerbaijan concluded a $8 billion contract that was called Con Contract of the Century uh, to build joint venture of the key partners, uh, including also the Azeri, uh, national oil company Sokar, and then the British company uh, BP. So, Again, this is just to highlight that the informal regime has been building up. And uh, another illustration is a number of agreements. One agreement, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, these deals or uh, declarations. It's an uh, agreement between uh, Turkmenistan and uh, Kazakhstan in February 1997, uh, between uh, Russia and Kazakhstan in 1998, uh, and then uh, between Russia and Azerbaijan in 2001. So these are all bilateral. It's not, again, it's not multilateral, but bilateral agreements that step by step led to the signing of the uh, uh, convention on the, on the Caspian Sea. And of course, finally, I think I forgot to mention agreement between Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan signed in November 2001. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, just a few words about China's presence in the region. So uh, Ch Caspian region is uh, part of uh, Belt and Road Initiative projects. So China invested huge amounts of uh, re uh, in resources into building, uh, especially energy projects. And uh, furthermore, uh, uh, there are multiple energy routes that uh, add up to the competition between the uh, regional powers in the Caspian region. And uh, of course, uh, there's a huge potential in the Caspian region in terms of developing and becoming one of the largest suppliers of the world uh, in, uh, for uh, energy. Uh, but my time is running up. So uh, I'd like to just s sum up this uh, with uh, the message that uh, I wanted to highlight, which is on the two points. So the first, first is that uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize that the informal regime prior to the signing of the Caspian Agreement has been building up. We saw that several bilateral agreements were signed by the states, and then the countries uh, started uh, exploring the resources of the Caspian region. And then 
Secondly, on the geopolitical side, uh, it's uh, uh, China's increasing presence uh, in the region, uh, especially the uh, China's uh, cooperation with Turkmenistan. Uh, now Turkmenistan is the biggest gas uh, uh, exporter to China and uh, Kazakhstan is one of the biggest um, oil exporters to China. So, uh, and then finally, the sanctions against Iran and Russia that uh, all uh, in combination, all of these factors contributed to the uh, multilateral agreement on the uh, legal status of the Caspian Sea. Thank you, Serik. Uh, also, very good input. Uh, of course, you are absolutely right that informal regime, uh, which uh, helped to devise this Caspian uh, Agreement in 2018, have to be appreciated. It's a long process, uh, process which includes bilateral, sometimes trilateral uh, cooperation among countries. And countries' interest to develop Caspian Sea as gas and oil resources were driving this cooperation. And of course, also geopolitics. Uh, maybe role of China, but also other uh, great players uh, with interest on Caspian Sea have been forcing Caspian countries cooperate more and uh, come with this uh, 2018 agreement. Actually, it was a surprise agreement, uh, but if people, as you say, doesn't know the background, they may see overnight they signed this agreement, but it was a very long process of uh, negotiations and the bilateral works. Thank you for very good highlights and also highlighting some uh, opportunities for Caspian region to go north or south or back to China. These are the opportunities for economic development. It is not uh, mutually uh, excluding each other. Sometimes it could be both ways. For example, these car car corridors could link Asia and Europe. So very e excellent inputs. I would, this is the part one of our uh, uh, today's meeting. I uh, would like to thank our experts, uh, uh, Dr. Pritchen, Dr. Marco, uh, Dr. Berman, and Dr. Asghali for their excellent inputs. Now we have to, uh, of course, address questions from the audience. We have limited time, so therefore I think I would like to ask our colleagues be short and brief. Uh, I hope uh, Stanislav is back. If he's not, uh, we will uh, ask him later this question. First question, Stanislav goes to you directly. Uh, how much realistic is the Caspian visa project? What is your assessment? You are muted, uh, Stanislav. You are muted. If you could uh, unmute yourself. Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, unfortunately, this is not so easy question because even within Caspian Five, we have with the regime, for example, with Turkmenistan, with Iran, and even among five countries, uh, we don't have free visa regime, and in such circumstances, to find this common plot platform for free visa regime is quite problematic because it uh, included a lot of changes in legislation in all five countries. So now diplomatic works is going on, but we'll see how it is possible. So I hope it will happen soon. Thank you. Yes, it's not an easy, uh, exactly easy question, but uh, I think the overall regions are trying to introduce this kind of visa regimes which will be beneficial to all of them. Next question, maybe uh, uh, Stanislav, you or Gerald, you could help me. It's related with ongoing uh, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, how it affects these planned mega projects in Caspian Sea, uh, relations between Azerbaijan and Iran uh, are in balance, not to mention. So these are the really now uh, quite a fluid situation. What's going to happen? And, not only the Caspian countries looking, today we had the meeting of CAREC program. Many countries are looking forward to see when everything will be settled and what will the future uh, of these uh, security issues. Maybe Stanislav, you can start yes. and then maybe Thanks. get- I, I wanted to, to mention it in my uh, presentation, but uh, I was too short in time. Uh, yes, this is very dangerous uh, development in relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And the problem for trans-Caspian uh, infrastructure that the line of contact where now we could see uh, aggravation just 40 kilometers from uh, pipelines, Bakut Belisi Jihan, Bakut Belisi Jerum. In such circumstances, it's quite possible uh, to, to destroy it. But the political issue and political uh, obstacles and of circumstances of this uh, step 
is quite significant. On the one hand, uh, Armenian side announced that in case of negative scenario of developing situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia could use its weapon, rockets, missiles to destroy this infrastructure. Uh, but this step is very, very dangerous, uh, first of all, for Armenia, because from the economical point of view, it's not so much time to repair infrastructure. But uh, from the point of view, international image of Armenia, uh, because of this is multi-billion dollars investments of Western companies, it's quite, uh, it might be quite drastic for image of Armenia as an aggressor. And in such circumstances, it, from my perspective, the possibility of this step of Armenia is quite low. And from the point of view of general uh, investment climate, so look at the history of 1990s, uh, just after several months of the ceasefire agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan in May 1994, uh, the consortium of uh, Western companies uh, signed an agreement about future projects. In such circumstances, we could see that it's quite uh, important, but not uh, decisive for investors. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Stanislav. Maybe, Gerald, you want to add some few words, if you? Yes, just a few things. Um, thank you, indeed, um, for, for the question. I think what, what should be known about the Caucasus in general that for centuries it was a fairly, um, if you view it from the, the region's large powers viewpoint, a problematic region. Um, and, and this didn't stop after 1991. Uh, American optimism proved to be fairly unfounded. Um, the Russian, well, Moscow's viewpoint was far more pragmatic. They were arguing that, well, there is a need indeed to extract all the oil uh, from the Caspian, because what wasn't mentioned uh, for the past hour is that it's very obviously is the largest landlocked, well, seer indeed. Um, and um, this poses very um, serious difficulties when it comes to transporting oil or indeed gas, um, because you need to um, need massive ports um, connected to the oceans to transport it. And the Caspian very obviously doesn't have this. And so uh, Moscow was already arguing even 30 years ago, well, 25, that um, pretty much everything should be transported up north. And they were arguing for that. Um, indeed, to the south, you can't really, because that's Iran and due to American sanctions, uh, which are biting quite heavily, nobody's going to support such projects. But um, I think for the foreseeable future, as Stanislav mentioned, there is really low chance of uh, the conflict escalating to the extent that pipelines would be damaged uh, just as much as Azerbaijan already signaled that they have no intention whatsoever shelling um, directly to Armenian territory. So these kind of uh, very thin borders will be, I think, maintained not to damage the local economy too much, but I wouldn't be overly optimistic about future conflicts. Uh, these will ponder, indeed, hinder uh, the ability of the region to develop to some extent when it comes to external investments. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah this is, uh, you know, uh, everything depends. Uh, uh, a lot of things are linked, uh, economy with policies and politics, and uh, uh, also countries who are along the Caspian Sea interested to uh, continue these growth, which they had. I mean, this was extremely successful development, at least last uh, few years. Uh, and we are looking forward that uh, security situation will improve and this uh, will allow economic uh, development further. I have a, a few questions, uh, Kali, to you, which is related to environment. We are colleagues, actually, I'm also environmentalist. So let's address these questions. First one is uh, related to understanding of uh, that archaeologists, historians, are they confused fish tools with horse tools? And do you know if there are cultural elements influence this confusion? Historically, has meat been more highly valued than fish along the Caspian? This is the first question. And second question related with the water quality. Are there countries cooperating on water quality issues? Are there any joint efforts to monitor quality of water in, in the Caspian Sea? Please, uh, Kali, uh, respond to, it, to these questions. Thank you, colleagues, for all of these questions. And yes, sorry to um, throw in a bit of maybe confusing archeological um, 
information, but yeah, so what um, archaeology is, again, like any discipline, ongoing and investigations. So what, um, and what many archaeologists will say is that they proceed with a certain sort of narration of the region being very much one of high mobility, horse-based, but um, there's been a lot of emerging research over the last, I'd say 20 years, but especially in the last 10, about um, the seasonal, um, the seasonality of these kind of migrations and movement. And that um, when there's also been more technologies made it, making it possible to reevaluate or look at some of these apparatuses. And so it was really, what was key for this was the isotope analyses showing in human bone remains that actually fish-based protein, because there's a different ratio of nitrogen and carbon in the bone remains, that fish was much more significant. So, um, and then when this sort of opened up the discussion again for, oh, okay, can we actually go back and reevaluate horse tools? It was most, um, it was mostly um, horse bits, which are metallic, but they were found to actually have certain hook features that could be, um, that were fishing apparatuses. And so it's, I guess when we can appreciate or see that, um, there's still so much that we have to learn about the, the region in general, just because of the nature of oral based societies and what is recorded in the historical record still is, is really important to be to bear in mind, I think. And that, so with this in mind, we can really look to cultural practices still being very significant ways in which former ways are recorded. And so for me, that was what was really significant was the transition of, as I mentioned, these national cuisines or national ditches of Beshbar, Makar, Plav, when that meat is substituted, that that actually, is a signifier of a very um, um, old or a, a different kind of relationship with how a resource is utilized and resource use patterns around a resource that really should be um, reminded or borne in mind. And so it's not so much a matter of um, is horse meat or is red meat more significant than the other, but it's that how each the utilization of resources condition the use of each other. And so in harvesting fish, for example, and being connected to riverways and because actually most sturgeon is harvested as they swim up to spawn um, in tributaries, not in the Caspian Sea historically. That's only been within the last hundred years with the scaling up of commercialization from Soviet industries. Um, that um, it enabled certain pastoral practices. And so there's a very old um, knowledge system that enables one another relating to red meat and to fish meat as well in the region. And so when we look at, um, or when we can evaluate a resource use today, that when we see within all three countries a return to a protein source um, rather than caviar, that is that is quite interesting and significant from, from my interpretation. As far as the water quality, Skandar, you might probably have uh, more to comment on this, um, at least from the agriculture perspective, um, Again, a lot of the, the whole industry in general started because of um, electrification projects, but then also it was increasingly important for um, water quality issues. But most of the issues that we're looking at today in the region come from the very end of the Soviet era when there wasn't the same kind of investment in um, maintaining important infrastructure. So um, there is a lot of, I think that when we can look at certain um, points of cooperation within the region and coming together over these issues, like the Caspian Sea Agreement, I mean, that this is actually really significant. So we might not see the same kind of um, development on or expectations of deliverables on certain timescales, but the fact that there was this interest also with the 2003 Tehran Convention, um, specifically coming together for um, convention or for environmental management, that this signifies something really important that there is still a very important interest or desire for this kind of cooperation in the region. And that's how this, that when there's this kind of foundation that's, uh, that holds for a lot of promise, I think. But please, Eskandar, you might be able to comment more on the water quality than I. Maybe only a little bit, okay. You are right. I mean, this uh, Tehran Convention actually looks after the environmental health of the sea. And uh, we just recently, for our analysis uh, of one, one of the research papers, we analyzed water quality contamination levels, uh, uh, looking to trends. And we saw that after 90s, after the collapse of Soviet Union, the quality a little bit improved. And it continued until mid-2008, uh, nines, And afterwards, it, again, uh, the contamination of the sea uh, with uh, uh, oil is increased. But the countries has a disagreement. They have this instrument to cooperate. Uh, the big issue 
what we found out is the data issue. Uh, of course, data sharing and also data standards are, are a problem, but each country has their own station, which uh, regularly uh, temporarily takes uh, analysis of the sea. Uh, this data have to be shared. I think in the future it will be uh, improved. Uh, and also other thing very good is, and I also maybe share the links with the participant. Actually, they uh, some years they also released this uh, publication on environmental status of the Caspian Sea, which is very interesting source for the information. So I think these are the attempts done, but overall, I think water quality is a concern because of deterioration of water quality. We have, we have seen this uh, deterioration of the biodiversity and fish species, all these are interlinked. And I will stop here because I think this is a very interesting area itself and it may take a long time to uh, maybe even a uh, whole session. Uh, the last question, maybe I will ask Sarek from you. Uh, there is a very interesting question about the perspectives of civil shipping transportation by ferries uh, between the countries of the region, how it develops, what is the future? Are there any prospects or economic uh, future? Please, sir, if you could uh, help us to address this question. Uh, on this civil shipping, I don't have much to say, but just a comment because I'm not an expert in this particular area, but uh, it, it looks like uh, the economic situation with the COVID uh, pandemic uh, in across all uh, Caspian states uh, is now uh, deteriorating and of course the crisis economic crisis that affecting the most of the world and uh, uh, will uh, the Caspian region will not be an e exception although of course there have been developments and especially in the uh, area of tourism development uh, in, uh, in the region there have been uh, recent developments uh, the shipping of oil uh, in the Caspian Sea is has been uh, practiced uh, for a long time because uh, there is no Trans-Caspian pipeline. So the the countries, uh, for example, uh, there is a shipping of oil from Aktau port in Kazakhstan to ba Baku, and then it could be sh uh, sh uh, then later piped uh, via uh, Baku Jihan Belisi uh, pipeline. And I think there was a hope uh, in terms of these Trans-Caspian connections that there was a hope that with the agreement on the illegal status of the Caspian Sea that uh, there'll be more Trans-Caspian pipelines. There's the one was called TCGP, Trans-Caspian Gas Pipeline, connecting Turkmen city of Turkmenbashi with Baku. And then another way of uh, connecting Aktau and Baku. But I think at the moment, uh, the, invert, the investors will be unlikely to uh, start these ambitious projects as, as given the economic uh, situation and also given the instability in the region because there's conflict is still uh, ongoing uh, between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. So that's all that I can say on this. Thank you, Serik. And indeed, I last year, I also myself in August attended uh, Caspian Economic Forum in uh, Turkmenistan. Uh, and I have seen there is a ferry, uh, uh, civic ferry, which uh, takes uh, from uh, uh, the passengers from uh, Turkmen side to Azerbaijani side. And uh, information there was a plan to, to uh, increase the frequency of this uh, linkage. And uh, maybe you are absolutely right. We are now having different situation because of this uh, uh, lockdowns due to COVID-19 affected all these uh, uh, transport plans reduced the uh, frequency of this uh, change, but it started already. And I'm sure there, there will be more uh, such plans because I think this is, as I uh, have told in the beginning, this is interesting road, a lot of uh, interesting opportunities, both economic and also cultural tourism. Uh, these are the areas uh, historically, as Gerald said, a lot of interesting discoveries to be made by, uh, by people. Colleagues, I have to stop here because uh, we have a time limit. Uh, but it's really a fascinating meeting and in this short time, less than one hour, we visited history, economic uh, uh, opportunities, uh, environmental problems, cultural aspects of the Caspian Sea. One thing is uh, sure that this is very interesting area. Actually, uh, we had also some time ago discussion that this landlocked countries of Central Asia, for example, looking Caspian Sea as a door to opening up the West, the East and all other parts of the world. And vice versa, I mean, these countries also could be a good corridor for linking with other parts of the Asia and Europe. 
but uh, we have limits. Uh, we have also geopolitical interest uh, competition, economic interests and competition. We have environmental limits, which we have to uh, take care. So all in all, I think this is very, very uh, interesting area to look after, to research, to study, uh, and also to try to make some kind of lessons from uh, history and from culture of this region. I would like to thank our speakers, uh, all of you, uh, excellent inputs you have made, and also colleagues who have put in questions. I know questions will uh, come afterwards. Therefore, please, uh, you have here contacts of uh, our organizers. Uh, please don't hesitate and send your questions. Uh, we may follow up uh, with uh, responses. Uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers, an excellent event uh, and also very interesting. Uh, myself learned a lot. Thank you for organizing this event. But before I close the meeting, uh, we have a very good, uh, interesting video of uh, our journal, our essay. I would like to ask, ask Bajena to play this video and afterwards we can finish our meeting. I would like to thank you very much uh, again. Maybe I will pass the good shot to you if you want to say some concluding words. Otherwise, from my side, uh, thank you very much to all people, participants and organizers and speakers. Hello, Dr. Iskander, for such a great meeting. Thank uh, to every speakers and for joining conversation and discussion we had today. It was a pleasure to have you. And uh, I, like now, uh, Bajena would like to play a little bit introduction video, like about a magazine. So it would be nice to watch it. Bojana? Yeah, thank you. And um, while well, I'm sharing my screen, I don't have an access. So. Uh, Dr. Iskander, could you please um, give me access for share screen? Yeah, I, I will pleasure. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I don't know how to do it because I wasn't. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, you, you, okay, okay. I'll try now. Okay. And uh, what? Yeah, sure. No problem. And um, I also would like to thank each and everyone for contributing. And also I would like to thank Dr. Saxena from Cambridge University for his support. And, um, and also, as I mentioned before, um, I'm an, an editorial assistant of o Open Central Asia Magazine. And I would like to, um, if someone is interested to contribute not only um, for our magazine as well and get a subscription, uh, I would love to connect with you and reach out to you and also always be in touch. But well, you know, I did you organize it. You may try now. Um, I don't think I can, um, just because I'm using also a laptop and phone. So I have another users. Yeah, I did you organize it. So uh, you should now be able to. Um... Give yourself an admin rights from your cell phone to your computer. Okay, now I can see. So yeah, here we go.
across the magazine when I was a student and I was wondering what this OCA stands for, which is Open Central Asia. Later on, I was lucky enough to write an article about Marc Chagall's art. OC Magazine is a unique magazine which brings cultures together. This is the main purpose. I've known Murat and the Open Central Asia magazine pretty much since the beginning and would highly recommend it to anyone, not only the seasoned traveller, but also perhaps the complete beginner. It's a magnificent combination of business, culture and social articles which really bring to life this amazingly vibrant and rich part of the world. Open Central Asia magazine was founded over 10 years ago now, just after the end of the last financial crisis. And now as we sit here today in a new era of uncertainty and turmoil, I remember back to what people said to us in 2009. They thought we were crazy. Why did the world need to see anything from Central Asia when we were so busy battling with our own lives and recovering from the financial crisis? But in fact, there had never been a better time to bring out such a magazine a magazine that would bring to the fore the relevance of Central Asia today for people both from Central Asia in Europe and those in Europe who might be interested in going to or transacting with Central Asia from a business perspective. So we've always been keen to bring the opinions, issues, news, events, cultures and traditions from Central Asia and now even the Eurasian region as well. 